did today, just so you know, um, in terms of um, how it works. Uh, you are all on mute, um, but if you do want to um, uh, put down any questions or have any uh, issues with the tech um, or hearing, please just pop something in the chat and we can keep an eye on it to make sure um, you can get the most of today. But we'll be also sharing the webinar on our website after today uh, if you want to catch up or, um, uh, or share with others. So welcome everybody. This is the first of our Green Minds summer webinars. As I said, today's theme is all about nature connection for placemaking. We'll be hearing from two guest speakers who will be sharing their work around uh, research and, and best practice uh, in this field. That's um, Professor Miles Richardson, we're welcoming from the University of Derby, whose research focuses on human factors and nature connectedness. And he's the founder and coordinator of the Nature Connectedness Research Group in the UK and Nature Connections Conferences. And we're also welcoming our uh, local to Plymouth, Gemma Sharman, um, who is leading on the delivery of the Green Minds programme, uh, a nature based solutions uh, programme in Plymouth, uh, which uh, is funded by European De Regional Development Fund. And she's going to talk a little bit about um, uh, nature connection in practice uh, in the city. So there's a few people uh, still coming in, so uh, welcome to you all. If you do, um, if you just joined us, we're trying to get a little feel for um, who's in the who's in the group today. So if you can uh, just go on to uh, the slido.com and click on polls um, and you can just answer the first question just so we can start to understand how relevant do the people here think that Nature Connection is uh, to their work? So if you can just pop into Slido, that would be brilliant. So just to say a little bit while you're doing that about who I am, uh, I'm Zoe Sidnam and I'll be your host for, for the webinar today. And I manage the Natural Infrastructure Projects team at Plymouth City Council. And Green Minds is one of a range of initiatives we're delivering with partners across the city and, and beyond uh, to ensure that nature is at the heart of our decision making and, and that we secure investment into the creation of high quality natural spaces in our local communities. OK, so I'm hoping that um, you've all had a chance to go and, and do the poll. So just to explain the running order, we will have our two speakers give their presentations and then we'll follow with an audience Q&A. As I said, your microphones are disabled, uh, so please, though, feel free to use the chat function and put any questions uh, in as, as it goes along. Or again, if you've got any issues regarding tech or, or there's some problems, um, please pop them in the chat and we'll endeavour to, to answer them. What we will be doing as you go along is trying to collate some of the questions um, so that we can ask them at the end. And I'll endeavour to ensure we do get through all the questions. Um, but if not, we'll certainly look at them post webinar and we'll be feeding back to, um, to participants um, in terms of uh, trying to answer those questions. OK. So I just get rid of this. So without further ado, I would like to hand over to uh, Miles Richardson. As I said, he is a um, professor at the University of Derby, focusing on human factors and nature connectedness and the founder coordinator of the Nature Connectedness Research Group and Nature Connection Conferences. Uh, he also works uh, with a number of conservation NGOs, such as the National Trust, RSPB, and one of his recent projects includes um, the One Million um, Project developing nature connectedness based interventions to improve mental health. He's also a member of the Natural England Research Strategy Group and works with partners on a national indicator of nat nature connection, the Nature Connectedness Index. So uh, welcome, Miles. I'm going to hand over to you to share your presentation. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Zoe. I'll just uh, do my navigating. Welcome to uh, all and thanks for coming along. I'll just uh, find the correct thing to share. There we go. So uh, yeah, someone will someone will jump in. I'm sure if they can't see the slides and they can't hear me. So uh, all going well, I think. Thank you. Yeah, all fine. So yes, um, I'm um, been introduced. Barnes Richardson from the University of, of Derby. You can follow. The, the work that we're doing, if you find it of interest um, on my blog or on uh, Twitter, 
uh, and there's a web page for the, the research group as, as well. So I'm going to start off quite generally with a with a bit of a global context and a, and a UK focus. Um, you'll all be well aware that um, we have a climate crisis, as indicated there by the, 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 the school protests, school strikes. Um, we've got a biodiversity crisis, which is very, very real, depending on the figures you look at, 60, 70 percent of, of our wildlife has been lost since 1970, which you don't hear too much about, very sadly. Um, I think you could say we've got a mental health crisis, and I think you can link that through to our relationship with nature as well. And just one indicator of, of, the, of the many that are available, four minutes, 36 seconds. Uh, I think that's good in our, in the context of this, this is some research that we did in Sheffield where we tracked 800 residents uh, with a smartphone for a week. Um, and we found that the median time that the, those residents spent in green space each day was four minutes, 36 seconds, which is obviously a lot less than it would have been uh, when we were evolving in our habitat that, uh, that sustained us for uh, a few hundred thousand years. And I think you can see signs that our relationship with nature is, is failing in, in everyday advice and in everyday, in everyday life. So this is perhaps the most well-known model of well-being uh, that's out there. You'll all probably recognise the five five ways to well-being um, derived from a 317-page uh, report in 2008, I think, um, if I remember correctly. And I think the word nature appears once. Um, and it is when you look at the actual guidance on the NHS websites and MIND website where they give the guidance around um, connect, give, be active, etc. None of them mention nature. So it contributes to our disconnection because why would anyone think that nature is good for well-being if it's not in our main our main guidance? And it's so easily those five uh, ways to well-being are so easily integrated with nature as well. And so we like to think we're a nation of nature lovers, perhaps. We cherish our poets, we cherish our landscape artists, we cherish our naturalists and love our nature documentaries. But when you look at the figures, this is visits along the bottom and well-being along, uh, along the vertical axis, uh, the United Kingdom visits, visits nature less than these 18 nations, mainly, mainly European. And then we've also measured nature connection, nature connectedness across those 18 nations. And you can see again, we're, we're second to bottom, bottom of the European sample and second to bottom. And I've put a, a circle around uh, a number of dots there, and uh, you might uh, come to the quick realisation that all of those speak English and used to be part of the British Empire. So it makes you wonder whether there's some long term disconnection which we've uh, exported and is, is kind of deeply ingrained into the way we live our lives. And we've done some research which has only recently been out. Um, uh, and we looked at why across those countries uh, nature connection is lower or higher. And it came down broadly to the level of income and prosperity. Uh, the more, the less connected people were. The level of technology and smartphone use, the more, the less connected people were. The level of biodiversity was really a strong uh, relationship. The more biodiversity, the more connected people are. And the way we use our land, the more pasture land, the less people, uh, less connected people are. The more arable land, uh, the more connected people are. And urbanisation wasn't as strong a factor as you might think it was, but there, there was, a, was a relationship to urbanisation as well. So that's the kind of national context of, of a kind of failing relationship with nature. And I mentioned a long view. If you take a very, very long view, um, clearly humans evolved very embedded in the, in the natural world and lived a, a hunter-gatherer lifestyle. And 
there's been various revolutions along the way. The agricultural revolution, uh, the scientific revolution, the industrial revolution, and I suppose we're going through a technological revolution at the minute. And you can look at that and see how we've become very dualistic. People kind of now live in boxes with their technology and very distant from, from nature, uh, which is features four minutes a day in our lives. And the nature has got less biodiverse because we're, 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 we're not particularly engaged with it and we're not particularly caring about it. And what we do is we have now recognised that problem and we're trying to restore nature and we're trying to change behaviour. So we're still treating in a, uh, thinking in a, a dualistic way. We, we could try and restore our relationship with the natural world. And this is another slide that kind of says the same thing in a way, but I think you can see the loss of biodiversity and the the the, the uh, amount of carbon in the atmosphere as symptoms as a failing relationship. And when something is ill, it's not always the best job to treat the symptoms. You want to relieve the symptoms, obviously, but the cause might be something different. And we need to start to think about the relationship between people in the natural world as well as as well as treating the, the symptoms. And thankfully, on a global global scale, people and big organisations are starting to talk about that. So the, the UN Secretary General there, urgent need to transform our relationship with nature. Similar statements from the, the Executive Secretary of the Convention on Biological uh, Bi Biodiversity. Uh, and then also IPBES, which is the, the, the kind of less well-known cousin of the, the IPCC. Um, so the UN uh, body that's looking at the causes of biodiversity loss, and they see the human nature relationship as, as an underlying cause. And they're currently looking at a transformative change assessment, which will consider the human nature rela relationship. I'm an author on that, and we're looking for uh, changes that can be intentionally promoted, accelerated and scaled to maintain and restore the human relationship with nature. So there's a, a global context uh, where people are looking at this. And then, as we've seen, a very high need in the UK to look at it because we're bottom of the table when it comes to, to the nature connectedness and relationship with the natural world. So I've mentioned nature connectedness a few times. You might be thinking, well, what is it? Um, it's different to visits and exposure to nature. It's a psychological construct that's accepted around the world and it's grown rapidly over the past 10 years in terms of the amount of research that has been in, uh, in it. And it's a person's sense of their relationship with nature. And that can be an emotional relationship and it can be a bit of a cognitive relationship in terms of whether you feel uh, and think that you're, you're, you have a place and relationship with the natural world. Um, as a psychological construct, we can measure it using uh, psychometric scales, and we've found through developing interventions that we can we can change it and we can have lasting effects where two months down the line, it's higher than it was uh, when we did the intervention a couple of months before. So that allows some science and evidence, which is always useful when you're trying to persuade people that this is a, a useful way to go. It also provides some clarity and focus within the fragmentation. We, we're using the, the word nature connection today, but some people think that that's just visits to nature. We're talking about it in terms of this kind of relationship with nature. And some other research that I won't, I don't have time to share in detail, but when you look at um, biodiversity and well-being across those nations that were in, in, the, in, the, in the charts earlier, um, nature connectedness relates to both. It relates to human well-being and it relates to biodiversity. Whereas rankings such as the progress on the sustainable development goals don't. So it's quite unique in, in uniting human and nature's well-being, which provides a good target uh, to aim for for a sustainable future. So why nature connectedness matters? Um, it matters for, for human well-being. So there's been uh, quite a lot of research on this now involving multiple dozens of studies and that have been brought together in systematic reviews and other research as well. And broadly, it's good for feeling good and functioning well. So feeling good, things like vitality and happiness, 
functioning well, having meaning and purpose in your life, personal growth, etc. And there's other um, uh, positive outcomes as well that have been found, such as pro-social behaviour and a better body image for people who are more connected to nature. And those circles that are, look like they're being tossed around in the air um, are um, the results of just one study that we were involved with that looked at nature connectedness and nature visits together and how they predicted well-being or explained well-being. And what we found was that nature connectedness explained uh, well-being in terms of eudaimonic well-being, that's a uh, feeling that your life is worthwhile, um, more than nature visits did. And in some um, research that we've done since then, nature visits weren't significant when you measured nature connectedness as well. So it's not just visiting, it's the engagement and relationship that matters. And socioeconomic status is there because that's a benchmark that the, the, the government tend to use. Um, nature connectedness was four times more powerful in explaining the, the difference in that leading a worthwhile life compared to socioeconomic status. So it's quite a powerful effect. And the other reason it matters is people who have a closer relationship with nature do more for nature. So another systematic review here of 75 studies, they found a strong and robust association between nature connectedness and pro-environmental behaviours, uh, and as well as evidence that there's a causal link. So that's emerging for wellbeing as well. So when you do an, an empirical study, you can increase nature connectedness and you find that pro-nature behaviours increase and you find that wellbeing increases as well. So hopefully, you might not be fully convinced because it's only been only been five minutes, but hopefully you're starting to see that nature connectedness is a is a good thing and a useful construct. Um, so a little bit of detail on how we go about increasing nature connectedness. And it is most straightforward and simple way. It's by prompting people to notice nature, which might seem oversimplistic in some ways, but we found with research that we've done with the National Trust, for example, most people don't notice nature. When we asked via a, a, a national YouGov survey, we found that people uh, uh, said, 80% of people said they rarely or never watch wildlife or smell wildflowers or photograph nature. 60 plus percent said they didn't or rarely or never listen to birdsong or notice, notice butterflies. Um, and then we did some analysis in lockdown as well, um, which uh, I'm sure you remember is nature visits went up a lot and life slowed down for a couple of months in, during the spring. And what didn't particularly get reported was that noticing increased by 74%. So nature visits went up by 40%, noticing went up by 74%. And that noticing of nature explained levels of higher well-being uh, better than the visits and it explained uh, an increase in pro nature conservation behaviors as, as well right whereas visits didn't so, so more evidence that there's a need to focus on connection over simply visits and time they're very easy to measure so that's why there's been such a large amount of research into that area because um, it's easy to measure and if you research study can only make recommendations based on what is what what is measured so a little more on the power of noticing the good things in nature just a, a, a quick look at a couple of specific interventions that looked at mental health where we found significant increases in mental health and nature connectedness sustained for a month by asking people in sheffield to to notice nature prompted by their smartphones um, uh, for a week and that had lasted for a month. That's when we found out the four minute, 36 second figure from. Um, and we've done uh, research in gardens and found it and found it worked by getting people to notice the good things in nature in their gardens. And then we've had a clinical sample as well where people were in group walks and asked to notice the good things in nature. And we found a really high uh, increase in well-being uh, in the walking and doing the three good things in nature compared to a control group. And we've also been looking at audio meditations and, and such, but we're focusing on bigger, bigger 
things and scaling it up today. Um, so that type of research has informed the RSPB Nature Prescription Pilot uh, and Mental Health Awareness Week, etc. So out of all of that, we came come out with some very simple advice. Stop, look, listen, enjoy nature, which we call the green, the green care code, which is at its most simple level. But we need when we need to transform the relationship with nature, clearly we need to think a bit bigger than that. We need to think on a, a more societal scale. And there was a um, design framework called the Pathways to Nature Connectedness, which was developed at Derby uh, a few years ago. Um, and without going into too much detail, it has five pathways, uh, sensory contact, uh, appreciating and noticing nature's beauty, uh, prompting people to, to have a to recognize their emotional relationship with nature and how nature helps manage their moods etc um going a bit deeper into our relationship with nature and how it has a meaning in our lives and celebrating the role of of, of nature um and celebrating nature's calendar and uh, celebrating nature through art and getting involved in artistic pursuits that involve the natural world and then the fifth is compassion, which is helping people to care for nature. So you could do that in your gardens or you could provide a community space where people can feel free to 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 get involved in uh, managing and improving the, the, the habitat close to where they, they live, for example. So they're the pathways to nature connectedness and they've been very successful and widely adopted just a, a few um, Quick examples there. They were used uh, in 30 Days Wild, which is just coming to an end. Now that started in 2015. So I think you can do the maths. Is this this must be about the seventh or eighth year, is it? Um, and then uh, we looked at the original activities that people that are provided for people to get involved in, with, and we structured those around the five pathways. And a million people have took part in the first five years and they improved their well-being and pro-nature action. We revised 50 things to do before you're 11 and three quarters with the National Trust based on the pathways as well. And there's also started to be some design of places, uh, urban green infrastructure and uh, Durrell uh, have also used it with the, the design of their butterfly house, which you can see a, a picture of there. But those pathways can be <coughs> applied to places as well places that we might call habitats for connection if you wanted to, um, and how we can design places and spaces to prompt engagement with nature, to encourage people to notice nature because they don't notice nature. Um, and so we're encouraging people to actively create spaces and opportunities and prompts to pause and notice uh, the good things in nature, sensory engagement, emotional engagement with the natural world, having nature on people's doorsteps um and providing opportunities as i say to care for nature in an everyday environment with resident management for example of wildlife friendly gardens um and then having making sure that the corridors biodiversity corridors and biodiversity initiatives come close to where people live and creating prompts festivals installations whatever we can think creatively think of to encourage people to find meaning and uh, whether it's and everything from it can involve social prescribing, for example, uh, where if people see nature is important for well-being, it's going to have a more meaningful place in their lives. So this is a complex slide, but it tries to capture the idea of, of scaling up. Clearly, um, programmes like 30 Days Wild are wonderful and they engage, engage hundreds of thousands of people, but there's a need for more structural change to achieve transformational change. And so here in the red arrow are some of our negative relationships with, with nature. We use nature as a, a resource that's fueled the industrial revolution and our wonderfully modern lifestyles. We control nature, we control the flow of rivers and various other things. And that has produced the failing relationship of warming climate and biodiversity loss. So that's pushing down. We need to moderate those, those behaviors but we also need to promote the green behaviours, the senses, emotion, beauty, meaning, compassion, which lead to nature connectedness, lead, lead to the benefits of mental well-being, 
pronated behaviours and pro-environmental behaviours. And this is where you can start combining the, the pathways with leverage points in systems design. So that's the idea of this blue pivot uh, and then the, the, the longer lever on the other side. You can try to work close to the blue pivot by changing parameters and standards. You might have some success, but you're going to really struggle to, to, to make any transformational change. Or you can move to the other end of the, 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 the lever and try to change the intent and the mindsets and the paradigms and the values of our systems. And our systems are our organisations that exist within our cities and various systems within cities and across and across the country as a whole, whether it be education or health, and you can start to have a, 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 a paradigm where you're thinking about our relationship with nature in education it would be a simple change to make on a piece of paper in terms of the aims of education, but that's obviously a very difficult change to, to achieve. So trying to, to work up uh, and apply those at the, the more powerful leverage points to create a more sustainable uh, and worthwhile life. So um, just coming towards an end now, um, there are some broad implications for policy. And I think what um, Plymouth and Green Minds have done is they've they've done the creating, creative thinking to think how you can scale up those pathways and applied it in a in a city context, which is fantastic. I'm I'm not a, an urban an urban planner. I can I can enjoy a conversation with people to to think up creative solutions. But in Plymouth, they've done a great job of of taking those pathways and applying them in a in a city context. But more broadly than that, you you can start to look at arts policy, for example, that celebrates nature, health and social care policy that uh, includes nature in social prescribing, as I've been saying, education that has a, a green thread of human nature relationships thrown, flowing through it, even our transport and infrastructure. How can transport be geared up to green commuting, which we're trying to do, but also can that contribute to prompts to notice nature as well, so that uh, it's not just low carbon commuting, it's commuting that engages people with nature along the way, for example, perhaps by using natural way markers or uh, things like that. And ultimately, providing visions of a good life, allow clear stories that the community can see that that shows that nature can manage our well-being and is important for our well-being, and uh, it can lead to a, a sustainable and meaningful life. So, if that's of interest, there's lots of detail on my blog, and we've also got you'll find links to these guides as well. Uh, our Nature Connection Handbook, which is just out, some other briefings, a, a booklet that we did with the National Trust. And uh, for those of you with a policy uh, mindset, the Mental Health Awareness Week policy briefing that we did with them, they did a really good job as well of taking the uh, pathways and putting them into a po policy context, which and that's a really useful document to seek out. But I'm sure end there. Happy to take your questions later and uh, we'll move on to our our uh, next, next talk with Gemma, I think. Thank you. Thank you, Miles. If you want to um, stop sharing, you can yep. pass on. There we go. Thank you. Just pop yourself on mute. Thank you. That was really interesting, uh, Miles. Um, quite some quite shocking statistics, I have to say, um, about where, where we're at as a nation in terms of nature connectedness. But um, but some really um, exciting research that you're leading on, which is obviously really helpful for us when we're working um, to influence policy. A little bit of feedback from the audience already, just um, in terms of how excited they are to see, see some of this work um, and that actually some people are um, already using uh, the Nature Connection pathways in their work, which is really uh, positive to see. And actually the feedback from the poll at the beginning is the majority of people here um, that joined at the beginning, I know some of you joined later, took part in a poll um, about how connected, <clears throat> how you use connect, Nature Connection within your role. And actually, it seems that the majority of people here are using Nature Connection in their role. So that's that's also really promising, despite uh, some of the challenges you outlined. Um, and I think um, I was quite um, taken by the stop, stop, look and listen. Um, as somebody who grew up with the Green Cross Code, 
Uh, and I think that's something that maybe we could think about how we how we could develop that uh, new green cross code um, as we go forward. And I'm really excited about looking at this as, a, as somebody who sits within strategic planning to think about, you know, how do we how do we do this on a societal scale? So with that in mind, I'm, I'm really excited to to hand over to Gemma Sharman. So Gemma is um, the lead on the Green Minds programme. Uh, she has over 20 years experience working on natural environment projects, both marine and terrestrial, with a particular focus on engaging communities in urban areas, connect, enhance and, and steward their local natural spaces. Uh, so as I say, Green Minds is a four year programme uh, externally funded to rewild people and places across Plymouth. And Gemma's going to talk about some of the nature connectedness pathways that Green Minds is employing uh, on the ground. Gemma. Great, thank you Zoe. So hopefully everyone can see the screen all right. It's always a bit, always a bit alarmed when I have to do these things, everything's working. So um, yeah, thank you. That, that Miles has just set the context beautifully um, for, for what the kind of the framework and the research and the evidence base for what we're trying to apply in Plymouth. And actually I should say before I launch in, um, Zoe and I um, helped develop the Green Minds bid. Um, that secured this funding together and we've very much um, evolved its framework together and I think it's really interesting actually without really being aware of the nature connectedness research and framework when we put the bid together actually how much of it has picked up on those elements and I think a lot of that perhaps is based on our experience as well as um, as well as looking at evidence that's out there but the, the nature connectedness work has really evolved since we started Green Minds so it's really interesting to see those those elements coming together um, and supporting, I guess, our ex our own experience in, in practice as well. So as Zoe said, it's got a four-year programme funded by the um, EU's Urban Innovative, Innovative Actions Initiative. Um, and it has, it's, it's a partnership of which Plymouth City Council are the um, leading partners, um, working with the National Trust, uh, Devon Wildlife Trust, uh, Arts University Plymouth, as it is now, previously Plymouth College of Arts, uh, Data Place, uh, the National Trust and Real Ideas Organisation. So I think I've got them all. So it wore a Plymouth-based partnership. So it was, it's, it's about working together in a place for that city, again, as Zoe said, for people and for wildlife. So trying to, again, bring that human nature relationship into one was really our, our starting point for this work. And we also really wanted to look at um, our, our urban nature um, as a whole system as well. So uh, again, Miles has really set um, that context of this about how we join these elements up so it's around policy it's around practice it's around working with different sectors different communities about our own uh, relationship with the wider natural world so of course this is huge so what we uh, we needed to do in, in the bid and in practice is is to kind of give this a framework and we, and we focus on on sort of five key areas and sites across the city to test this out but we also um, framed it around three main aims, which are around physical interventions. So um, that's really around uh, urban uh, rewilding uh, pilots on a neighbourhood level. So actually practising this work out on the ground. What does it mean to manage our spaces, different types of urban spaces uh, with, with nature in mind? So working with nature rather than against it. Uh, looking at our behaviour and, and attitudes towards nature, so that really chimes with the, the nat nature connectedness um, index uh, work that Miles was talking about. And and actually, we, we we sort of almost knew from our experience that we wanted to have this deep, enable this deeper connection, not just with communities and people that live in Plymouth, but also all of the different professionals and workforces that work in our city as well across sectors. So not just about people working um, to manage our land um, and and we, we understood that, that that kind of nature connection that deeper nature connection would also support more pro environmental behavior as well and again as I said the, the the sort of lens through through which we want to deliver our work is this systems change so recognizing that this is this is complex work um, but how can we start to map out that system around um, our relationship with the natural environment, our approach to land management in Plymouth, and and identify those those levers around change that um, can support longer term shifts. So obviously that, as Miles touched on, involves policy, it involves it involves um, things in practice, but I think it also involves our own personal connections um, as people that work in and and live um, in these spaces as well. Um, we our mid our midpoint progress report came out um, about a month ago so it's really worth um, 
if you want a bit more information, a bit more detail, I haven't got much time today in this presentation to go into it, but that lays out some of the case studies, some of our learning to date, and um, we'll be working to deliver on the ground over the next year as well, and, and working to kind of share the knowledge and the learning as, as we go along. And so I think, so please do have a look at that. Um, I think what we realised again as well, once we started uh, putting Green Minds into practice and working across our partners, that actually all of our core aims work to, to support placemaking in, um, through nature connectedness. So it really became quite a frame for a lot of our work around how we um, monitor and evaluate it, but actually how we deliver it on the ground as well. So it's been really interesting to, to sort of shift, I suppose, our focus and thinking about individuals maybe with nature connection to how we, we scale that up and um, look at it on a, on, a, and, and on a kind of placemaking neighbourhood societal level. I think before I give a bit more information, some of the actual things we've tried out in practice, it's just useful to touch on that urban element. Um, and it was quite interesting in Miles's research. I mean, there's so much from his presentation that I just kind of has, has highlighted um, some of the aspects of what we're doing. But that the urban element wasn't as big a factor in terms of our own relationship with nature connectedness. Um, cities are really important. You know, by, I think it's by 2050, 60% of our population is expected to be urban and living in a city. So it's, that's a really important part of supporting people's connection to nature. And as Miles said, that's about our own health and well-being, as well as uh, taking care of, of the world around us. And so as part of Green Minds, like I said, we have these urban rewilding pilots on the ground but there's this focus around wildness rather than wilderness necessarily. So it's about thinking what does kind of wild mean? Um, and really, I think for us in Green Minds, it was about having a, vi a vision of people experiencing everyday nature. So how can we uh, ensure that uh, people living across Plymouth can experience nature, but then also that nature can, uh, can be connected up again and um, we can support nature recovery for its own sake as well. And we also know that um, through ex, uh, national surveys, through the Natural England People and Nature Survey, of which I, I know Miles has been a big part of developing, um, we know that people in more deprived areas have less access to quality green spaces as well. So there, kind of, that's um, obviously quite um, creates kind of negative cycle. So if you live in those areas, you have less access to to biodiverse, nature-rich spaces, and that's going to negatively impact your health and well-being as well. So there's a really big opportunity in Plymouth to have. Um, to create those benefits uh, for biodiversity and people. And, and often cities are hotspots for biodiversities and threatened species. They can often be uh, islands where unique uh, species have thrived. Uh, we have some in um, here in Plymouth, for example, the horrid, uh, horrid, horrid weaver spider, something <laughs> like that that's really unique. But so again, how do we try and move away from them just being an island and support um, more habitat connectivity and but also celebrate and be proud of the fact that urban areas can be really beneficial for wildlife as well so just really wanted to kind of put that urban element in there um, so I'm just going to take you through really briefly those the main aims that I talked about around our physical interventions our behavior change our systems change uh, but first really wanted to touch on um, a monitoring and evaluation framework for Green Minds that has been um, based on the um, nature connectedness pathways. So for us, um, delivering Green Minds and thinking about what we needed to monitor and evaluate and, and look at the wider impact of the program, it was it was a, about um, how we do things as much as what we do. So uh, again, wanting to move away from this access to nature, kind of numbers, more quantitative work, to more qualitative work in terms of how are people experiencing these places? What is the deeper connection uh, they're having? Is there a longer term um, behaviour change or attitude shift, shift in terms of their connection to, to the natural environment? So partly based on our own res research, as I talked um, and experience from the beginning, but also then researching into kind of tools out there, we um, start to learn more about the nature connectedness um, pathways and the nature connectedness in index. So it, it provided us this really well uh, research tool that could provide a robust framework for all, our, all our, our activity monitoring. So, for example, all kind of engagement work on the ground, we um, all participants are part of um, that we measure their impact in terms of that nature connectedness on each activity. But again, wanting to look at also how we scale that up. So, for example, we have used um, the Natural England's People and Nature Survey 
uh, questions, which now have a whole section around nature connectedness, thanks to the, to the work of Miles and his team at Derby, um, and mirrored those in our own uh, local level um, surveys, for example, uh, the, the school health and wellbeing survey now, which goes out to all the primary, secondary, special schools, really high return rate in Plymouth, has its own uh, section that mirrors those natural England questions. So we can start to track that um, over a longer term. And then, like I said, we really wanted to look at the qualitative um, impact uh, of the work we're doing on the ground as well. So we've worked on a whole range of um, approaches uh, because it's such a broad project. Um, so, for example, our partners, University of Plymouth, uh, one of the uh, pieces of research they did, particularly during lockdown, was looking at social media analysis, sentiment analysis around our attitudes to nature. So that could really show sort of local differences, but also very site specific information. So, again, uh, searching for those words that pick up more emotional, kind of deeper uh, um, connection and meaning around nature. So that's been a really interesting piece of work as well. And then other conversation we wanted to look at who are who's using our spaces uh, how are they using them uh, who isn't using our spaces who manages our spaces who works on them so we've we're working with our public health team on a series of appreciative inquiry conversations which is really about having much more open deeper conversations to, again to gather a richer picture of of um are um, not just use of these spaces but spaces but nature connection value of spaces in plymouth um, and then how we can obviously use that evidence to inform the work that we do on the ground. And of course, you know, again, it was really emphasised in Miles's work that that um, we have really poor levels of biodiversity in the UK. So the point of this space isn't just nice creating like a nice path or a nice seating. It's about these being really rich uh, environments for people to go and experience. So uh, how can then uh, we increase the biodiversity of these spaces, but also link them up? That's a really important thing obviously that, that fits in a wider context around our local nature recovery networks. But we're, yeah, so it's about increasing the space themselves, but linking them up as well. And then uh, finally, part of our monitoring evaluation is around increased investment to those spaces. And that is about how we bring in um, additional funding, whether that's through developer contributions, the emerging world of environment finance and habitat banking, of which Plymouth's really um, leading on, but also um, how we animate those spaces as well. And, and we've been working with Real Ideas organisation around uh, nature based enterprise and, and stewardship models to really um, move those on as well. Um, so I won't I won't go into great depth, but just to this, there's more information in the report, but this table here, outlines all um, all of the work that we're doing around how it is um, informed through the nature connectedness pathway pathways. So I just wanted to touch because we haven't got much time today and I'm really aware time's ticking on but our, our, against our three main aims um, how we've applied them in practice on the ground. So we've talked a little bit about the, the physical interventions and improving biodiversity. We what we've really tried to do is work with people to co-design these places so particularly um, spaces up at Derriford Community Park, which is a large uh, city farm. We've been working in the west of Plymouth on a series of uh, local nature recovery network neighbourhood level spaces. So really interested in, in sort of neighbourhood and, and uh, nature on the ground and how we work together uh, in the wider placemaking to co-design those spaces so that people are involved in that design, but they're also involved in elements that will help them connect to nature as well. So whether that's the seating, increasing wildflower meadows, uh, fixed point photography that we've got as a way of monitoring the sites, you know, prompting people to notice views. Um, they can be quite small interventions, but they all help, again, build that picture of nature um, conservation as well. So we can start to find ways to bring in new people into those spaces as well that might provide um, little hooks through um, kind of digital technology. Um, uh, again, and we've tried different ways with, with, with smartphone um, tech as well in terms of getting people into those spaces. Um, looking at kind of sensory experiences and how we can enrich them um, working with kind of arts engagement to, to kind of to prompt different ways of experiencing the site as well so there's I mean there's a huge amount I could talk to here but um, I, I won't go into detail but again there, there is more detail in the report and um, I'm always up for answering questions and having follow-up conversations as well but this is obviously a really important that just that physical design is a really important part of our placemaking and I also just wanted to say that the other part we're working on is that connectivity so how we can sort of green up the grey areas areas and create those connections between more formal green spaces as well obviously behaviour and attitude change is such a crucial part of people's nature connectedness so it there is this thing at the, 
you know that you kind of build it and they will come but actually we do know from our experience of working in urban green spaces yes having a better quality green space is really important but actually facilitating that and uh, kind of welcoming people in giving them permission to be in that space to enjoy it to have more ownership of that space these are all really important parts of um people co connecting to nature as well so we we need to support that um we need to support that sense of place, not just provide the infrastructure. So a big part of what we do and in Zoe's team is, is around that behavior change and, and that kind of feeds through all our all our projects. So how can we support people to value nature, um, take action for nature and encourage those pro-environmental behaviors that we talked about? Um, and one of the things we're trying to do in terms of attracting new users in is to is a, is a model around see, think, do, care, which Emmy, who leads on the comms engagement in our team, has been doing a lot of work on. So how we move the sort of, say, social media engagement into actually action on the ground. Um, and, and we've done that through a range of case studies, um, one of which was around action for insects, again, very much a digital campaign, but then supporting that through a programme of uh, taking action for wildlife activities, providing resources, supporting a rewilding network to develop, um, again, moving people along that kind of journey and deepening their connection to nature has um, really been a part of that. And as, as Miles said, you know, in COVID, when we took all other options away, we know that our nature connection went up. And so now, we, you know, we have so many more distractions, we have to work harder to kind of move people along on that journey as well. And big part of that has been around creative engagement. So working with um, Arts University Plymouth and their students and also running a series of creative commissions that are in, in play at the moment. We're, we've been using those through very much neighbourhood local spaces, working with um, community networks in that area to look at a series of arts based interventions and and to um, we're working also with the University of Plymouth to, to qualitatively um, evidence the impact of um, creative pathways to support nature connection as well so there's just a few examples of the images but these are really targeted at reaching out people that perhaps aren't engaging in those spaces might have really um, even more lower levels of nature connection in the first place but also, you know, again, this forms part of placemaking because this is either either these are interventions, creative interventions that are happening places that might prompt different conversations, different ways of connecting, or they are um, they are bringing new people into places and and helping develop that kind of sense of place and, and a pride in where people live, as well. So again, there's a lot more we could say about that and and other work that we're doing around um, green social prescribing um, at Central Park too. I'm, I'm aware of time, so it won't take up too much longer. But again, this, this lens of systems change is really important. It's, it's about bringing together all the work that we're trying to do. Um, we, we sort of mapped our Green Mind system. Um, Zoe's research around her, her master in public health has actually been really about that systems approach and starting to identify those key levers that, that we want to have in terms of scaling up our work. You know, like I said, we've tried that our Nature Connection focus hasn't just been about individuals and community level groups. It's about working with professionals as well so whether that's our land management workforce um, uh, or whether that's looking at other sectors in the city and how they can start to take uh, more decisions with nature in mind so one of the examples of that was around our nature-based leadership program that we ran with Realize Earth and actually we've got a webinar on the 7th of July which I'll flag up at the end um, to, to delve into that a bit more deeply but again that was all about um, looking at our own social values and, and how we can put those into practice in our workplace, looking at our uh, systems approach um, to help facilitate our own deeper connection with nature and thereby starting to influence wider policy and practice. So we can already see this happening in place. Um, we're working with our um, community empowerment team and, and building nature connection into that framework at Plymouth City Council. But other partners in Green Minds have also been taking that on. For example, Real Ideas now have a, a nature and neighbourhoods theme as part of one of their key strategy aims. Um, Arts University Plymouth have now incorporated environmental justice as, one, as part of their cultural change as well as social justice. So these shifts, these wider shifts are starting to happen. And um, that's a really exciting part. And it's something we're really interested in is how we start to use then these other policy levers around the Environment Act, our joint local plan review in Plymouth, uh, the local nature recovery network, all these, there's some big policy levers at the moment that we want to, to benefit from as well. And, and, and finally, I just wanted to touch a bit on the, the community stewardship work we're doing as part of that too. So another big part of this systems change is around um, how we facilitate communities 
uh, to take more ownership of the spaces in their own neighbourhoods. And again, that's happening um, across Plymouth in a number of models. So there are, um, for example, a, a park, uh, we're working with a village hub, a community group um, has now taken on um, management of an area of their park and they're working to have a, a more nature-based approach approached um, uh, within that park themselves and they're able then to skill up their volunteers and they're taking care of that and they're starting to value that space much more because it's it's theirs and they have ownership and they can see the change happening in practice so there's a whole range of work we're doing around different stewardship models and enterprise that I think would be another webinar topic in itself so where are time I always talk too much um it's a lot to say so we just really wanted to end uh, by but a bit of a challenge, a bit of a prompt to take our own action to support nature connection. You know, the types of questions we ask can transform our own organisations and how we work. So we're going to ask you in a minute about if you if you feel after this webinar, um, do you think nature connection is more relevant to your work or your life? Um, and just to remember that we can all take action immediately. This could be really something small, like take delivering a meeting outside in a natural space, or what you know, what would your policy you project design or decision make uh, look like if nature was seen as an equal stakeholder? Is there a nature-based solution that you could explore here? So have a think about those, you know, th think about your own systems where we might be able to influence change. I think some really exciting opportunities for us to be scaling up this work, obviously not just in Plymouth, but 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 nationally and beyond. And um, yeah, we'd really like sort of Plymouth to kind of be a leader in that movement um, and take some of our, our learning forward into, into other work. So I will thank you all for listening and I'm looking forward to hearing some of the questions. Um, but I know we'd just like to take one more poll um, from you all. So I'll leave this uh, slide up for a moment. I think it's going to be popped in the chat as well. Uh, it's the same um, uh, Slido uh, website as before with the same uh, code. So pop that in and, and if you can re-answer the question, that'd be fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Gemma. So um, every time I hear about Green Minds, I, I get excited. So um, it's it's great to see both the work that Green Minds is doing and the ripple effect across the system that I think it's already having in Plymouth. So I'm going to um, pick up on some of the great questions that have, have come up in the chat. And like I said, um, with time is short, but if we don't get through them, we'll certainly come back to you uh, with the responses. So Something for Miles, um, there's a couple of questions around the connection between availability of green space and nature connection, and if there's any differences between uh, age and gender uh, as well in some of the research that you've been doing around that. Yep, um, very briefly on age, there's a, it changes over the lifespan, starts um, okay, dips and drops like a stone around to 13, 14, when there's lots of other things going on, and then takes about 20 years to get back to the population mean. But the overall mean is still too low for, for a sustainable future. Uh, um, females have a higher level, st statistically significant higher level than, than, than men. So that's, I think it was 63 to 60. Um, and then the business around access to green space, that it's, it's very complex and it gets entwined into visits and time. But I suppose this is the point to re-emphasise. It's not about contact, it's about connection and relationship. So we've actually found um, in some research that uh, higher levels of neighbourhood green spaces were related to lower levels of nature connectedness. That was just one study that was with, with children. Um, because green spaces, can be amenity grassland, depends how you classify them, um, with very low biodiversity. Whereas there's research that has found that nature reserves and urban urban nature reserves, people who live close to them have high levels of nature connectedness. So it's never simple. Doing the mapping work is more difficult, so there's not so much as that, but it comes back to engagement and biodiversity. If there's more biodiversity, nearby and people are engaged with it, they're going to have higher levels of, of nature connectedness. Um, but you can't just measure it in time and proximity and visits. Um, it's, there's got to be engagement. And also there's the reality of life. Everything works together. Time works with connection. You can, we isolate things to prove them in research, 
but in the reality is that they'll work together as well. So to keep that in mind. Thanks, Miles. I think it's a really important message for how we design our urban green spaces and, and how we maintain them as well and, and for biodiversity. So you're just talking about engagement. I'm going to hand over to Gemma for another question. Um, someone's a little bit interested in um, how the local authority engages with the public. Um, they've given an example of um, a patch locally that um, community weren't aware that was being turned into a wildflower area. So some examples around that and um, how you see the role of volunteering perhaps developing um, within Green Minds or, or other projects. Yeah, it's a huge challenge. The, the, we really recognise communication, engagement are just the big challenges um, ac across the city because often what we end up with, I should say, our teams in, in the council, we're not called funders, so we're often reliant on external project funding. So we, we can have really good resources to do great comms in certain areas and engagement work, in-depth engagement work in other areas, and then perhaps less less in some areas. So it, it, there is definitely a disparity in, in perhaps the level of resource around that. We really recognise that's a challenge and it is something we are trying to work on about how we can kind of move away from that, that kind of project directed work. Um, but we've also been working through another project called Future Parks Accelerator with the National Trust and the National Heritage Lottery Fund around our future green space management. So beyond green minds. Um, and that has been about how we do transform our communications and engagement around um, changes to the, the management of our spaces. Um, for example, we've recently digitally mapped all the green spaces around grass cutting in Plymouth. So we have a digital management system that our, our streets uh, and, and parks workforce will see, but also we are making that available now through our, our website as well. So people can look at the grass cutting regimes in their areas and see which areas are regularly cut for more amenity grass and on which are left longer and allowed to be more wildlife meadow um, rich areas as well um, and we're just rolling out some signage actually now on some of uh, the, the, the bigger sites across the city in terms of uh, again quite playful signage that is letting people know why we're doing that as well in terms of you know to support wildlife um, so it, it's kind of multi-pronged approach but it is and it is really challenging to cover that in a whole city where you know our actually our core workforce around our green space management is is stripped to the bone and have very limited time so we're looking at how we can put in tools in place that don't take huge amounts of resource to manage across the city um, in terms of the volunteering comment I think what we're recognizing around our, our, our green spaces our, our natural spaces in Plymouth is that um, we need a participation of spectrum a participation spectrum that the kind of perhaps the traditional volunteering model is um, isn't necessarily fit for how we live now that that kind of longer term or intensive formal volunteering there's a place for that and that's really important and and we see that in, in with our friends groups across the city and and bigger sites um like dare for community park where we've got more formal volunteering but what we're trying to do is offer other opportunities that might be more around micro volunteering or other ways of caring for their space um so it could be through um a, rewild, a specific rewilding project or it could be actually just doing some work on, on social media or, or supporting someone just to collect the litter in the area. So again it, what we're trying to create is, is a spectrum um, around that now to, to give people different opportunities in different ways that, that, that might benefit them. Thank you. I'm aware of time so I'm just going to fire at Miles. Final question. Um, what um, What's the kind of focus for your research now? What, what's kind of most interesting you, exciting you, where are you going with this next? Um, I think the kind of what we've been talking about, the, the scaling up and linking in with systems thinking is, is one big area. Uh, we've got a big um, UK future treescapes project. So we're looking at how uh, trees, which is one of our clearly most salient things within within our landscape in towns and, and beyond, and how, how you might design our future treescapes to improve people's nature connection. So they're, they're two biggies, but there, there's there's lots happening. There's many, too well, many to too many for me to remember. <laughs> that's great. I'm I'm intrigued uh, with our Plymouth and South Devon community forest. We'll we'll have to um, have a conversation with you about that. So yeah. um, thank you so much to 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 Miles um, from the University of Derby and Gemma from our Green Minds project. Uh, really interesting presentations. And to you all for your questions. Uh, we, we've we recorded the webinar, so it will be available on our website, as will um, the presentation slides. And we'll also aim to follow up with any questions we haven't been able to, to answer today. 
And as Gemma said, uh, this is the first of our summer webinars. So the second one is coming up on the 7th of July. So please join us again. Uh, that will be hosted um, by um, Osbert Lancaster from Realize Earth, um, sharing some of the great work that we've been doing around nature inspired leadership uh, here in Plymouth and, and broader uh, with Realize Earth. So please do come along to that. Uh, we look forward to seeing you and thanks so much for, for attending today. Go out and enjoy nature. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you.